Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's December 8th, 2021, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. Today we take a look at two stories that Manga Bay has been reporting out of Southeast Asia. Both of these stories involve the land rights of local and indigenous communities in or near protected areas and highlight why consultation of local communities is crucial to building an equitable, sustainable future. Our first guest is Cynthia Ong, founder and chief executive facilitator of Land Empowerment Animals People, an NGO also known as LEAP, based in the state of Sabah in Malaysian Borneo. Ong tells us about the fallout from a story broken by Manga Bay staff writer John Cannon about a deal signed by government officials in Sabah without any consultation with local communities that gives foreign companies a share of the profits from selling carbon offsets and other natural capital from more than 2 million hectares, or 4.9 million acres, of the state's forests for at least the next 100 years. Ong tells us about what has been revealed publicly about this secretive agreement and explains why she wrote a commentary for Manga Bay, asking whether colonial history is repeating itself with this Saba forest carbon deal. We also speak with Jerry Flynn, a Manga Bay contributor based in Cambodia who has been covering a recent government decree that transferred ownership of 127,000 hectares, or nearly 314,000 acres of protected areas, in the highly biodiverse Cardamom Mountains region to the provincial government of Koh Kong. Flynn tells us that while ostensibly the decree is meant to allow landless families, many of whom were dispossessed of their land by the creation of the protected areas in the first place, to actually obtain land titles. But there are fears that it will amount to nothing more than a land grab by powerful interests. Land is one of the most crucial issues in Cambodia. There's a massive displacement of the population and there really hasn't been any successful efforts to address the issues of landlessness in Cambodia. On November 9th, an article by Manga Bay staff writer John Cannon was published with the headline, Bornean Communities Locked Into Two Million Hectare Carbon Deal They Don't Know About. In a subsequent commentary by Cynthia Ong published by Manga Bay on December 1st, Ong writes that even before Manga Bay broke the story, She'd been hearing rumors from friends and allies in Australia that some sort of deal involving Saba's forests, an Australian consultancy, and a Singapore-based corporation was in the works. The news was a surprise to Ong, even though the deal involved is the type of thing her work would usually make her aware of. As I alluded to in the piece that I wrote, I heard about it through allies and friends from outside Saba. So in this case, it was from Australia. People had heard whisperings of it within Australia saying there's this company called Tierra Australia and they're, you know, they're doing some deal with Saba. So f- close friends of mine who, who've been here, who know me, who worked with us, asked through, through text and said, you know, have you heard of these guys? Apparently they're doing something in Saba. And I was surprised because I hadn't heard of them and working so closely with all the various folks in civil service as well as civil society. I thought I would have heard about it, but I hadn't. So I asked around and, you know, so heard from one or two government colleagues that, yes, we've had those conversations, but they're very early conversations. We're still checking on the, you know, the bona fides of these people and there's nothing certain And certainly there was no mention of size or length of time. You know, it was all very vague. And then I heard again from from more people in Sabah that the the proponent for this deal was putting it forth. Again, you know, that it it was quite vague, didn't talk about length of time or how much land, just saying this person is trying to push it through. But there's a lot of skepticism and, you know, a lot of wariness around it. And then the next thing I knew, I think it was late October, was that it was being pushed for signing because of COP. That's COP26, the UN climate conference held in Glasgow, Scotland in late October and early November. And I said, wait wait a minute, how can that happen? Because there's been no discussion whatsoever. Nothing had been mentioned in the public domain, not among civil society, not even amongst our partners in government. And, you know, the, the, the idea of it being signed already was, uh, to me, that would be shocking. You know, we, we don't do things that way. 
And, and yet, lo and behold, I heard again whisperings that it was signed. And it was on October 30th. And then again, you know, I thought, okay, well, that makes sense because COP starts tomorrow. So whoever is behind this, you know, clearly got a strategy to have a presence at COP with this Saba product. So, yeah, that was sort of pre-Manga Bay article. That was, you know, what I'd, what I'd heard. And so from what I understand, the full details of the deal still haven't emerged, but what are the terms of the deal that have been made public? Well, the terms that have been made public are one that is called the Nature Conservation Agreement, and it's so far the first of its kind, of its scale. It's for 2 million hectares and for 100 years plus another 100 years renewable and it's made with a company called Hawk Standard Private Limited, which is a Singaporean company. And we've, you know, of course, many of us have gone, you know, online to see who are these guys, have not really found much. There's no web website per se of what they've done. Uh, you know, they're, they work in this field and, you know, it, it, you don't have to go too far to see that it's a shell company or that that's what it appears to be. The key proponent for this was our Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries, Jeffrey Kittingan, and which is strange because why would why would a Minister of Agriculture be making this his his you know one of his flagship projects? And he is also the Deputy Chief Minister. He's part of a coalition government, so he he leads his own party and at the very last moment in the in the last elections he moved from one coalition to another to form this coalition government so he holds a balance if if you like in this government and clearly something he holds as a as a trump card so as far as we know it it is for all carbon and non-carbon assets which is also vague in and of itself because what does non-carbon mean it's a seventy percent to Saba and thirty percent to the company deal, and uh, Saba bears the costs of management and operations, etc. On the ground, this company comes up with the management plans. It it is kind of bulletproof, so no change of government, no change of laws can affect it, and if they were to be impacted in any way at all by any changes in Sabah, then it needs to be compensated for the for the length of the agreement, which is 100 years. Uh, those are some key things. It also is bound by the laws of both Sabah and Singapore, uh, which is something we found strange. The, the signatories, there seem to be, you know, some interesting dynamics there because it was not signed by seemingly a, an officer of Hawk Standard, but uh, a Sabahan who used to feature in the field of, of the, the timber industry that it had moved to Australia. Uh, he, was this, he was signing on behalf of the company. And then, you know, again, you know, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. One can look, look for the background of the company and see how how it goes, you know, goes out into the world and who else is who else are associated with it. But and then there's a firewall as to who is the ultimate owner of this company in the British Virgin Islands. So all these things don't do not build confidence, I, I would say, for any thinking Sabahan who's just wanting to know who is this company that has gotten you know, half of our forests um, and we'll, we'll have rights over managing it for the next 100 years. How unprecedented is it for a nature conservation deal of this sort to encompass such a large area of forest and last for such a long duration? There was a deal in the past for a million hectares uh, for 100 years, and that was to a foundation, a, it's called Saba Foundation. It is enacted by, by law and it is for the purposes of education and health for Sabahans. They were given an area of a million hectares and that was back in the day of logging 
And that's what they did. Set up, you know, set up the, the regime for logging, um, bringing in an, an income for Sabah, for its health services and for scholarships and, and such for Sabahans to go out into the world and learn skills for the state. Um, but then that was, of course, awarded to, I would say it's a subsidiary of the government and it's a, a group of companies and it's now gone into other things like tourism as well. But that is the only precedent. Everything else has been in the region of you know 50,000 hectares, 100,000 hectares at the very most for timber concessions. Certainly never anything at this scale. So Jeffrey Katingan, the deputy chief minister you mentioned as the chief proponent of the deal, held a press conference and spoke publicly about the deal for the first time on November 18th. Was that a pre-scheduled press conference, or do you think the fact that Mangabe broke the news about the deal forced his hand? It, it certainly forced his hand. That's my, that's, you know, how I see it. What he said, he said in other statements is that they were going to announce it to the public early next year. I think he said in January, when he had funds to announce. And so my speculation is that what they were hoping to do was get some bites at COP, you know, enough to be able to say, Sabah, here's X million dollars, and we've gone into this deal, and it, this is what the deal is. You know, sort of presenting it as a gift, if you like. You know, so that's that's what I'm speculating and everything he's, he has said has sort of pointed to that. In that press conference, Katingan said that there would be a pilot project of 600,000 hectares, right? So does that mean that the deal will only go on to encompass the full 2 million hectares if the pilot project is a success? I'm trying to recall uh, whether it was called a pilot. I think it seemed like an initial 600 was to be committed by the state and then and then of course you know going up to the two, the full 2 million but it sounded more like it was just this incremental the state could commit 600 now and then it has to commit to the full 2 million I see okay and has there still been no announcement of what forests will actually be included in the 2 million hectares Yeah it seems to be that it's the protected areas of Sabah, which is in in the region of that scale, 2 million hectares. Of course, those of us in conservation question the the whole concept of additionality because they they are already protected in various forms. And, you know, there's been a lot of work by many agencies, uh, some civil society groups in either the protection or the management of, of those protected areas. And, you know, we've, we've grappled ourselves with the whole concept of additionality within the, the carbon realm, you know. So, so we were a little surprised saying, how are you going to get past that uh, with an area of 2 million hectares, which is totally protected? And just going back to your, your other question, I don't think he or they meant in any way to have any kind of public forum about the deal. It was very much as a result of the expose in Manga Bay. And in fact, there were other communications that showed that the the guys who were at COP were instructed to stop their promotion of the Sabah deal at COP. And I think it was as a result of the the investigation that was being carried out by Manga Bay. On this question of additionality, in other words, what further benefits can they provide in terms of conservation of these forests, which, as you point out, are already protected, I know that Manga Bay's staff writer, John Cannon, spoke with Peter Burgess, CEO of Tierra Australia, for his initial piece that came out in November. And Burgess said that in addition to supporting ecosystem restoration, the agreement would protect these forests from mining and logging, and that communities would still be permitted to fish and hunt and establish timber plantations to feed into the pulp and paper industry. What's your take on that? Does this ring true to you? Well, to begin with, I think the the threat of mining and logging is not a real one. 
uh, as per you know what Peter said. They are totally protected areas. So if there was any of those kinds of activities, those would have would be illegal. And there are certainly communities within our protected areas. And this is something that we in civil society have been grappling with. We've been grappling with it with our government partners. You know, do we provide community use zones? Do we excise these areas of protected forests um, for those communities? They are, you know, native customary rights to be addressed. Um, it's a whole complexity of, of situations. So, so there was a, a simpli- simplification of the problem so far in the communications uh, around this deal that, you know, they would have had FPIC. FPIC is the right to free prior and informed consent recognized in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Before, when the areas were gazetted as protected areas, which is not the case, we know that for a fact, and that the, none, none of this will, will impact their livelihoods, which is something I feel we, you know, given, given the opaqueness of everything, everything thus far, how can we be assured of these things? And, and also, it will no longer be our say because the, that land area has been signed over to this company and they will prepare the management plans. I hope in practice that, that what was planned was that it would be in collaboration with Saba. But, you know, there are definitely no safeguards and nothing stated within anything that we've seen so far that have... That have you know, protected the rights of Indigenous peoples and local communities. So there was no consultation with local communities before this deal was signed. But I know that in his press conference, Jeffrey Katingon said that FPIC wasn't required in this case because it would have already happened. That consultation with local communities already happened back when the forests were designated as protected areas. But you're saying that didn't happen either? Yes, there's been no FPIC. You know the tensions that are that are that exist for me as a civil society leader. One was the closed process with no consultation at all levels, not on the ground, not with civil service, not with civil society, not even with the executive body of the state, not with a state legislature. This was really done with a few people, and and then secondly, of course, the indigenous native customary rights and free prior and informed consent were not seen as relevant. So it appears nowhere, as I said, in in any of the comments, literature that we've seen thus far. Uh, The other thing, of course, that concerns us is, you know, Saba has jurisdiction over its forests. and, And I think by that, it means that it has jurisdiction over its carbon. And we are part of Malaysia, uh, and the federal government has stated its NDCs at COP. NDCs are nationally determined contributions or the emissions reductions pledged by countries under the Paris Climate Agreement. And it's also stated uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. And I think it would need all of the forests that that are in Malaysia, including Sabas, to achieve uh, our NDCs and the 2050 carbon neutrality target. So there was no discussion with the federal government, uh, no, nothing, no alignment of, of plans, of targets. As far as we know, that component was completely overlooked. The other thing that is we have not seen anywhere is discussion around safeguards and standards. You know, as, as, you, as you know, the international community have come up with a, a range of standards um, voluntary standards, there's the, you know, the, the UN framework. Not, none of these things are mentioned in any, any literature we've seen. Um, and there, be, there was no talk of additionality, no talk of double counting, state, federal, and international. So, you know, we, we're concerned about the obstacles we're putting ahead of us with regard to the local, the national And then, you know, the global interface. There was a lot of what I would call financial carroting. Uh, There is so much money to be made, literally money growing on trees, that you will all have a four-wheel drive and a swimming pool. 
you know, and, 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 you know, this is how many billions will come from this annually for a hundred years with, with no formula or framework to back up that, you know, the, the finger, the, the figure that was being dangled in front of us. And I think that really created the a basis of the, of the narrative that's going around that, you know, wow, you know, we, we can really all be wealthy with this. Why, why would we say no to this? You alluded to the fact that Malaysian law gives the Sabah government authority over its forests, but I know that civil society has been pushing for more input into decisions about forest management and conservation for a while. This deal seems to really help make your case that civil society needs that input and that standards like FPIC also need to be taken seriously, no? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's such a huge thing. You know, this, do you to develop something like this bottom-up and, of course, have the aspiration at the, at the kind of macro level, but make sure the process is, is grown from the bottom-up. So there's, you know, societal understanding of what is carbon, what are the benefits, what are the pitfalls, what are the potential threats. Uh, what I've seen from, from this happening is that there's, there is very, very little societal understanding of what carbon is, how it contributes to, to climate change and, and, and how the, the local connects to the global. Um, this is just, you know, this is something that we talk about every day, but it's not something that lay people talk about every day. So we realized as we were trying to build awareness around this, the, the details of this deal that, you know, there, there wasn't a basis of, of understanding and, and even the understanding of what FBIC is. I mean, I think people want to have the right for, you know, for a say, but don't, don't always know that they have a right. So all of these things, you know, we, we got, you know, we've been eyeballing the reality in this past week saying, you know, how much work there is to do to grow this, this literacy and, and in a way kind of recalibrate as a society so that we, we understand what's happening in the world, really. I, I think, you know, you can, you, you, you've had your own experience of it, I'm sure, in the U.S. and, and internationally, uh, where you have people's heads in the reality of fossil fuels and et cetera, and then the need to shift to, to this different world where carbon is the equation we need to be thinking of. You know, just like everything has been monetized, I mean, why are we surprised that this is now the new commodity? And just as we have good captains of industry, we will also have the folks who want to make a fast buck and they will take advantage of this. So in terms of safeguards and standards, I think, you know, we can make something, you know, like the golden standard that may not actually lend a hand, you know, to folks like us right now who are struggling through what we're struggling through. I think if the lay Sabahan or the lay, lay civil society person would say, we want to have a transparent carbon future. We want to be part of the, the global community in bringing emissions down. And we want it to be the pathway in, you know, in which we build equity in, in this new economy. I, I don't think I, I'm exceptional in, in wanting that. It's just how do we create enough understanding or build enough understanding that we, can know, we know where the pitfalls would be you know, in, the, in the path for that future of equity. Um, not just within Sabah, so not just locally, not nationally, regionally, but between the north and the south and the east and the west. You know, one of the things I heard today was a video of the proponent saying, what's amazing about this deal is that we're the first to put 2 million hectares on the market for companies who are polluting in the world. The biggest polluters will pay us for their pollution, for their right to pollute. And I was thinking, no, no, this is, <laughs> this is not the vision. But, the, you know, this is how it's being touted. 
Yeah, that seems like a really important point. Consultation with local communities isn't just about the future of these forests and how they're managed, but also about forging a shared vision for the future we all have to live in. Yet it seems like this case really points up the power imbalance between international corporations and government officials aligned with them versus indigenous and local communities. Well, I've seen in my lifetime what the big timber deals have done parceling Sabah out into 100,000 hectare units that are then given to companies who show that they can manage those units for 50 years, 100 years, and log sustainably, quote, with a return to the state in royalties. I've seen how that has created a, a great divide between certain parts of society and then the people, the people who live within those landscapes, who have been there, you know, longer than than there were uh, forest reserves and enactments, uh, and certainly before these units were declared, and and they find that all of a sudden they're in encroachment of a forest reserve that is designated for commercial purposes. I and I see. You know, Malaysia just came out with its development plan for the next five years, and it named the 10 poorest districts in Malaysia, eight of which are in Sabah, and eight of which are, you know, living in in these areas. Um, I, I don't understand why we're not seeing the correlation, you know, between our sort of business as usual with with the whether it's the timber industry or the palm oil industry or rubber or you know that that we are creating these situations and if this deal is doing the same old you know process which is extremely top down even more top down than those others were because it's saying here's 2 million hectares over 100 plus 100 years with with no consultation not even with the civil service agencies you know i i think it we've gone back in in you know into into time we've regressed um you know if we're still making decisions in that manner you know for large areas for a long amount of time and with so few people, but impacting pretty much every Sabahan and also future generations. Yeah, and you make a similar point in the commentary you wrote for Manga Bay about this deal, which you close with the line, I am speaking up in the absence of truth. Tell us what you were trying to get across in that piece. Well, um, well, it was actually more of a cathartic piece uh, at the time. I think what's perpetuated here is a a very silenced dynamic and where we seem to keep, you know, within the bounds of that, of that um, code of conduct, if you like. And, and if you, if, you know, it's almost like we know it's forbidden to say something. Um, and that is what keeps things the way it is or the way they are. I didn't want to speak for the organization. I didn't want to speak for others. I felt, you know, this was very, you know, it was quite personal. And I, you know, wanted to to call out some of our habits, I guess, uh, that we really, you know, needed to see. The things that we were repeating through the generations and, you know, that allowed that would allow something like this to happen. And so I was in a way finding my voice in in the, the midst of of the silence, the not just the silence, uh, but the silencing uh, of a voice. You know, it was for me, I needed to draw a line and say this, I, I cannot accept this just as a human being. And I wanted to call out, you know, the, the, the politics, the you know, the, the blindsiding, you know, all these things that, that I've, I felt uh, that, uh, contributed to this moment where this could even happen. One thing that I've been grappling with, and I read this somewhere, I, I just can't remember where, you know, how we've heard about rights of nature and a few places in the world where they've, they've put something in place. You know, here we are saying, well, rate, 
nature is going to right our sins. All we have to do is put this on the market. And I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> why is nature expected to now right all the things we've done and continue to do? And using the same mechanisms that got us here, uh, which is the capitalistic market mechanism. You know, the, the, there's a part of me that feels fundamentally that this is disrespectful. You know, we, we have done what we've done that, that uh, has caused loss of our carbon sinks, you know, putting out emissions into the atmosphere. And now we're saying to the remaining beings, let's just call all these trees and, you know, blue carbon and all that. We're saying, can you now suck up all of this shit that we've put into the, into the atmosphere? So we can continue our lives. And so, you know, some of us may even make money out of it. Uh, at, at a deep level, this, this feels disrespectful to me. So I, I struggle with that. Our next story takes place in Cambodia, which is where Manga Bay contributing writer Jerry Flynn is based. He's been following the story of Subdecree No. 30, which was signed by Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen back in March of this year and makes 127,000 hectares, or 313,800 acres, of protected lands available for sale or rent. But as Flynn reports, conservationists are concerned that it will amount to a land grab in some of the country's best preserved ecosystems. One of the key things to bear in mind is that land is one of the most crucial issues in Cambodia, and it's it's really been that way. You know, the, the issue kind of really dates back to the Khmer Rouge. They destroyed all property deeds and land titles, and since then, obviously, there's a massive displacement of the population, and there really hasn't been any successful efforts to address the issues of landlessness in Cambodia. I mean, if you go back to 2012, there was Order 01, which was an an attempt, some would say a half-hearted attempt, by the government to try and uh, get people land titles because there were there were so many conflicts arising from land concessions that overlapped with people's farms, with people's homes. But really what, what ended up happening with Order Zero One was you, you saw a huge number of Cambodia's richest, most powerful, whether they be political elites or business tycoons, snapping up a lot of this land. And so when, when we heard that there was this, this new sub-decree number 30, and, and it was 127,000 hectares, or, or just shy of that, the sheer scale of the land being um, reallocated, I think that was when the alarm bell started going off because Khmer numbers are actually you know, remarkably tricky to translate. And so I actually, I had to ask my colleague, and like, are we, are we definitely reading this right? Like 127,000 hectares? It's not like 12,000 or 1,200 or something. And it was like, and he, he was pretty adamant. And yeah, it turns out he was right. And uh, it was just the, the scale of it that really stuck out to us because we, you don't usually see that much land being transferred at once. And it's also worth bearing in mind that these sub-decrees that they come from the very top. That will come from Prime Minister Hun Sen through the Council of Ministers. So it doesn't necessarily com- come from Cambodia's parliament. Um, it, it's more or less one person signing off on it. So this sub-decree number 30 transfers control of those 127,000 hectares from the Ministry of Environment and various conservation NGOs that assist in the management of the protected areas to the Kokong provincial government. And on the face of it, at least some of this transferred land is meant to be distributed to people who were displaced from their land by the creation of these protected areas, right? Yeah. So, I mean, Kokong is a a particularly difficult area, namely on the grounds that, I mean, 90% of Kokong is a protected area. You've got something like um, a million hectares um, or so of protected land. And obviously for anyone living in that area, the protected areas remain state public land, which means they can't own it. And while some indigenous communities have been granted these sort of um, 
community forest concessions. It's not a particularly good level of land tenure. It, it's not particularly secure. It doesn't really guarantee them a whole lot. And so, you know, this is why the, the sub decree, sub decree number 30, when it said that it was kind of granting 127,000 hectares to communities who previously haven't been able to own the land that they live on, the land that they farm, it kind of sounded in the Cambodian context too good to be true. I, I don't think anyone was looking at it thinking, oh, wow, that's 127,000 hectares going straight to communities. I think there's enough pretext from, you know, from Order 01 in 2012 that people had suspicions that this was, this was going to be abused somehow. So the ostensible reason for this land transfer is so that land rights can be handed out by the Kokong administration to people who were displaced by the creation of the protected areas and had no opportunity to actually own the land they were living and working on. Yeah, more or less. I mean, it's hard to read the motives of the Cambodian government on on a good day, but with this one in particular, it was um, it was tricky. And I think the people who had that they hadn't necessarily all been displaced. Um, they, a lot of them had just simply lived on protected areas that they weren't able to own. And so I think rather than it being an issue of sort of redressing the the, the creation of the protected areas, I think it was probably more aimed at placating a, a community or many different communities that had never been able to own their own land and as a result had always been in conflict with either uh, the Ministry of Environment or some of the conservation NGOs that were operating these eight uh, protected areas or they had been in conflict with companies who had been granted land concessions within these protected areas and so the idea especially you know we've got the commune elections are coming up next year, followed by the national elections in 2023. Um, and a lot of the people that we've spoken to, you know, they've, they've seen these kind of handouts of land, uh, sort of a bit of a token gesture to calm a population ahead of elections. So there might have been an element of that. But I mean, the, the landlessness or the, the lack of land titles, it's it's not unique to Kokong. It's, it's pretty much a nationwide situation. Uh, we've seen this in Phnom Penh with communities living around lakes, which are designated as you know, state public land. But then that land gets sold on to property developers, often politically connected ones. And the communities who live around the lake and rely on the lake for farming and fishing, they get evicted. And because they have no land title, they have no legal recourse. So they're immediately right at the bottom of, of that fight. They, they, they don't have any, any means to contest the government's decision to sell off this land. So if, if they were granted a land title, then there's, there's some level of legal protection. As you've alluded to, there were concerns almost immediately that these lands wouldn't actually end up in the hands of Cambodian people, but instead this would amount to a land grab by Cambodia's wealthy elite. You originally reported on that for Manga Bay back in July, and then in October you wrote a follow-up that detailed the outcome of an investigation that found those concerns were essentially spot on. Can you tell us about the investigation and what you found? Sure, yeah. Um, so I, I think the, the concerns were voiced by people who, who, who know what the Cambodian government's like. And I think anyone with, with enough uh, experience of of the government's approach towards land um, was probably suspicious of, of what was happening in, in Kokong. But our initial story on that in July, we really were kind of poking at the idea from a theoretical perspective. You know, it was, it was really based on kind of a, well, historically, we know that these land titling programs have not gone well. You know, the, the World Bank has, has spent millions on land titling programs in Cambodia that really, for the money that they've spent, has, has resulted in very little for Cambodian people. And so we knew from that that there was a good chance that this sub-decree would also be abused. But, you know, our suspicions really came to a head when we started to look and do the mapping. And we could see that so many of 
the parcels of land that had been li listed in sub decree number 30 were either entirely uninhabited forests, uh, you know, largely old growth forests, because Kokong is home to one of the, the largest rainforests left in the greater Mekong sub region. You know, it's, you've got the Cardamom Mountains. Within that, there's something, I think, 54 species that are on the IUCN red list. It's, it's this beautiful, contiguous ecosystem. And so when we saw parts of Kokong listed in the sub decree that were, were definitely uninhabited, well, the, the only reason that we thought people would want to, to try and make that land state private land, which you know, could be rented or sold, would have to be for the timber extraction opportunities. So that, that kind of pointed us in one direction, but then also looking at other parts of the sub decree, other areas within the protected land that was listed, it became clear that a lot of it either overlapped with or was adjacent to existing land concessions belonging to some of the most powerful people in Cambodia. So if we were suspicious initially, finding those elements within the sub decree, it started to become a lot more clear that this was probably not the philanthropic, philanthropic gesture that they had initially suggested. You also did a number of interviews with Kokong residents and land brokers in the region as part of your investigation. What did you find there? We first made the uh, terrible mistake of traveling to Kokong in rainy season. I mean, Kokong is honestly probably one of the most beautiful parts of Cambodia, but we had the misfortune of arriving in the middle of a tropical storm. Um, and this is where we really wanted to try and flesh out the theory that, you know, all of these academics, conservationists, and rights advocates who are based in Kokong, we wanted to flesh out the theory that they had given us that this land was, was not going to poor landless communities, but instead was probably going to wind up in the hands of Cambodia's richest. But yeah, we, we got uh, pretty badly rained on. Um, I mean, to the point where I think we had maybe seven flat tires in the course of the first four days covering this issue. It was a nightmare from the get-go. Uh, you know, visibility was just terrible, which meant that photography was a, a nightmare. But we got really lucky. We managed to more or less prove that there was a, a shady network of brokers who were buying up the land that had been recently delisted from these protected areas and was buying it on behalf of... We never quite got to the bottom of that entirely, but we know for a fact that there were certain individuals involved, the head of the Royal Navy, Thea Ving, and the Minister of Defence, Thea Bang, both who are from Koh Kong. And yeah, we, we managed to find that this was, it wasn't just happening in one part of Koh Kong. It's, you know, Koh Kong is, is a huge coastal province massive rainforests, cardamom mountains. You, you've just got a, a huge range of landscapes in there. And so we really wanted to make sure that the reporting that we did, it wasn't going to be so easily dismissed as an, as an isolated incident. You know, because I think even the most diehard, fanatical supporter of this government would concede that land issues are, an, are, are still very much a real problem for most Cambodians. So I think if we were to say, okay, it's happening to one person, it's happening to two people, that wouldn't really be enough to prove widespread abuse. And one of the tactics the government has previously used when it comes to illegal logging has been to play it off as small scale issues. It's not happening on an industrial level, it's only happening because a small number of people who don't respect the forest are, are out there cutting it down, which you know, we know isn't the case, but it was something that going into this story we were very concerned about. And so that's why we had to sort of spend a week traveling across Koh Kong, across six districts, and our findings were more or less identical. Um, you know, people were telling us the exact same thing, and the timelines all matched up as well. People were approached from the start of this year by people claiming to represent powerful individuals who they didn't want to name, and they wanted to buy land at quite an inflated price. Uh, they were offering very good money with the knowledge that the sub, -de sub decree number 30, which was signed in March 2021, 
um, would come into effect, making this land legally able to purchase and to sell on. So it took us a long time to really put all of the pieces together. But yeah, more or less, we, we uncovered that there was uh, an, an orchestrated effort to exploit sub decree number 30. One of the examples you talk about in particular in your article is Tetai Wildlife Sanctuary, which was one of the regions where areas were included in the decree, even though they were completely uninhabited. Tell us about what's going on there, just so our listeners have this example too. So Tatai, I think, was one of the areas we were most concerned about because of the selection of uninhabited forest. And we assumed that if the land had been selected in the sub-decree, then it was most likely going to end up being cleared. And so with that in mind, that was kind of one of the first places we really wanted to look into. And what we found from talking to people living there was that there is already um, a hydropower dam, the Stung Tatai hydropower dam. I think that was completed in 2014. And people had already been relocated as a result of the construction of the dam. But seemingly, there was going to be a, a relocation for people to move closer to the dam. Now, whether this was purely as a means of getting at the, the forests that were listed in the sub decree, is it just a case of they wanted to clear that land and with the excuse of moving communities there, or whether it was a case of making way for a lot of the Chinese investment that's recently kind of popped up in Tatai. It's still not really that clear yet. And I think in some respects, we're still sort of waiting for the dust to settle on sub decree number 30. There's a lot of uh, elements to that that I think will maybe make themselves clearer in, in the coming year. But it, it stuck out as well because the, the residents that we spoke to there, they, they were aware of the tactics of the government. They knew that in accepting these relocation packages, they would only be offered um, what's known here as like a, a soft land title. And, and so this is recognized by local authorities, but not national authorities. Whereas a hard land title would be registered with the, the Ministry of Land Management in Phnom Penh. Um, very few people have hard land titles. They're deliberately not given out. It kind of helps keep the ownership of land more fluid. So the residents were very reluctant to, to accept the relocation packages, even though they were being offered good prices for the land that they lived on. But I think because they knew that they were, they were not going to end up with the same plot of land if, if they ended up with any plot of land. We've seen, unfortunately, time and time again in Cambodia, the propensity for very powerful individuals to be able to bribe local authorities into writing land titles that predate the land title of uh, residents. And so they, then the, these companies or these tycoons can then kick people off the land saying, well, no, I, had this, I have a land title that predates yours. The land is actually mine. And, and we've seen a lot of these kind of tactics at play. So, and, and so have the residents. You know, they, they, if anything, they've got a better experience of it than, than what we have. And, and so throughout Kokong, you know, in, in Tatai, but throughout Kokong, there was very much a reluctance to accept any of these kind of offers to buy land or offers to be relocated because they, they know what's going to happen to them. You also write about some activists who are protesting all of this that's going on, and there have been arrests, and I, I think that's an important part of the story. So would you fill us in on that? Mother Nature Cambodia have been probably one of the most effective environmental NGOs in Cambodia. I mean, they, they were officially delisted or deregistered as an NGO by the Ministry of Interior a few years ago. I mean, their founder, a Spanish national, he was deported from Cambodia and blacklisted from the country in 2015, primarily because of just how effective their advocacy was in Kokong. You know, they, they prevented uh, a major hydropower dam, which was set to inundate indigenous land, displace communities, disrupt fisheries. It was, it was a very ill-conceived hydropower project. But as, as a result, uh, Mother Nature activists, they've consistently been targeted by the government. And, you know, in, in Cambodia, 
the the courts are more or less at the whim of Hun Sen. You know, there's, there's no judicial independence, and there's no oversight body that could possibly overrule Hun Sen. So Mother Nature have really been on the receiving end of it for several years. But this kind of, I would say, this accelerated quite dramatically last year. In September 2020, three Mother Nature activists were planning a march from Wat Phnom in Phnom Penh to Hun Sen's house. So not, not an especially far walk, maybe two kilometers or so, but the it was going to be a one-woman protest, one woman marching from one part of the capital to the other. And the morning the protest was supposed to happen, all three were arrested and charged with incitement, um, which is a nice vague term that the government uses for dissent and can get you, I believe, up to five years in prison. Then they were, earlier this year, sentenced to between 18 and 20 months in prison. So then another free activists, also from Mother Nature, were arrested in June this year for attempting to document the water quality of the Tonlesat River in Phnom Penh. And yeah, again, all three were charged with incitement. Um, and I think at that point, the government even brought in some charges against the founder who is no longer living in Cambodia and, and two of the other act activists saying that they were plotting to overthrow the government. It was pretty extreme. I think that would have been a 10-year prison sentence if they had actually been sentenced. So it was pretty extreme, even against the context of the recent sort of crackdown on pretty much all forms of activism or criticism um, in Cambodia. But then so it was very surprisingly, they were all, all six activists were released on November 12th, along with uh, another 21 other activists who were either union leaders or uh, political activists. And it was a, a complete broadside for the vast majority of us, I think, here, especially, you know, uh, journalists. It was uh, just in one day, a stream of people I would probably classify as political prisoners being released at once. But the, the Mother Nature activists, despite being, you know, between the ages of sort of 19 and in their early 20s, incredibly resilient. They've come out of prison and have immediately vowed to get straight back into their environmental activism. So fingers crossed that they don't immediately end up back into prison for whatever sort of activism they might be involved in later. So that they, they are on, under court supervision for, I believe, the next three years. So throughout that period, they can be taken back to prison for any reason that the, the government deems fit. Well, any final thoughts you want to wrap up with or you want to tell us anything about what's next for your reporting from Cambodia? I think realistically, there should probably be a lot more focus going on to what's happening on the Mekong River. Um, you know, you've got hundreds of millions of people who depend on that for survival and, and between hydropower projects, between climate change, overfishing, illegal fishing, uh, huge changes in land use throughout Southeast Asia. You know, we're probably going to see the death of one of the most important rivers uh, in the world within the next few decades, some people have estimated. And while I'm not sure I've subscribed to that yet, I'm, I'm still, I think the developments there are all very alarming. So I'm hoping to spend a little bit more time looking into that in the future. And I hope that some other journalists more talented than myself are also going to spend some time on it as well, because it's, uh, it's going to be a big issue, uh, especially, you know, as, as we've seen from COP26, where there wasn't really, I mean, I don't think anyone would really call it a, a particularly successful uh, climate summit. So I think, yeah, in countries like Cambodia, throughout Southeast Asia, where it is going to be hit hardest and hit first by the impacts of the climate crisis. Um, I hope there's going to be a little bit more attention paid in this direction. If you enjoy the Mangabe newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. 
Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news outlet, and just a dollar or more per month would really help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash manga bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash manga bay. You and your friend can join the listeners who've downloaded the Manga Bay newscast more than a quarter of a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcast from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash manga bay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at manga bay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.